Good afternoon. I am Rob Morrell. Uh, we will be, I'm, uh, I'm on the Rails core team, and we'll be talking about upgrading to Rails 5 today. <laughs> it's actually very easy. Um, first, you need to have a very good uh, Rails app, uh, which I happen to have one. Um, and uh, as you can see, we're actually currently on Rails 4.2. Uh, and uh, yeah, so what you need to do is you can go to gem files and you can say uh, 5.0. This is the most important step you want to run bundle update Rails. <laughs> um, now, as you can see, we are now on Rails 5. We successfully upgraded to Rails 5. So, oh, all right. I was kidding. <laughs> uh, this is actually a, I don't know if you know this, but this is actually a sponsored talk, which means I, I'm required to sell you something, so I'm not sure why you're here. Uh, anyway, I, I don't feel great about selling my own stuff, so I thought I would sell you other people's talk instead. Uh, that actually <laughs> sounds like a very useful talk. I'm sure it's a lot more complicated than that to upgrade a uh, fake Rails app to Rails 5, so um, if you have to leave now, that is okay. I might get fired, but that's fine. Um, so the other talk you're missing is called It's Dangerous to Go Alone. <laughs> it is in room 164, which is just across from here, I believe. Um, but I, I think the, the main takeaway for a talk is don't use Go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the other talk that you're missing is uh, React Native and Rails. Uh, the subtitle for the talk is a single code base for uh, web and mobile. So I'm pretty sure the talk is actually about Turbo Wings 5. So you can <laughs> that. room 160. Um, and finally, um, the last talk that you're missing for this um, is NLP for Ruby is, uh, I had to look it up on Urban Dictionary, I think NLP stands for Nobody Likes Python. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm just kidding, I, I, I promise I'll stop making uh, jokes about religion. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, this, I am actually Godfrey, you can find me in the inference of Gen Code. This is my colleague Yehuda, you can find him on the internet, this is why Cassie also has a baby. Baby's Twitter account is Why Kittens. Um, <laughs> we're both uh, Rails 14 alumni. We also make a JavaScript frame framework for Ember.js and Glimmer. You uh, did also on the Rust core team. We work for a company called Folder. We are hiring a senior engineer, so if you're interested, please come talk to us. Um, we actually have a product that I could sell you, but I didn't allocate enough time for it, so I'll just put it out there, Skylight. You can come to our booth and we'll be, we'll be happy to sell you probably there. Uh, I, I guess I'll tell you one feature. Um, we've worked on this thing this year called Grades, which compares your app's performance uh, to all other Scala customers, right? So basically give you a sense of where you're at, what your customer's expectation in 2017 might be. So uh, if you want to see that feature, again, come to the booth, we'll show you that. So that's it for all the Scalette stuff, and uh, now we're going to talk about something else. So, last year I gave a talk called, um, I don't even remember what it was called. But Might I have had saying, the same name as this talk. Yeah, 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 something like that. But last year I talked about a project that we're working on called Helix. Um, since I imagine not everyone here have been to that talk, here is Yehuda giving you a um, version of that talk in like five minutes. 10 minutes, let's say 10 minutes. Okay, let's do 10 we'll minutes. We'll see. Uh, and uh, we, we spend mm -hmm. most of the time working on Helix, the thing that we're showing you instead of the talk. So this is, um, you, you get to see the slide deck for the first time as, at the same time as you can. Here we go, 10 minutes. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, I also have a uh, sore throat so I can't talk, but thankfully microphones work pretty well, so hopefully that will be okay. Um, so as we discussed last year, uh, everyone is here today because they like writing Ruby. Uh, Ruby's awesome, but we also know that Ruby is slow. People say Ruby's slow. Uh, most of the time, Ruby, the speed of Ruby doesn't matter since the workloads that you're working with are I.O. bound workloads. Um, you spend most of your time waiting for a response from a database or something like that instead of doing heavy number crunching. Um, but even though it usually doesn't matter, most of the time you're waiting for a database, once in a while you end up with a CPU heavy workload and the performance actually does matter. Um, in Ruby, you can get the best of both worlds by using C extensions. For example, when you say require JSON in your uh, Ruby file, you get a native gem on systems that support it and a pure Ruby version on systems that don't support it. 
Um, the C version is very fast, and better yet, uh, as a user, you can't tell the difference between the Ruby version and the C version. Um, this suggests that one way to make Rails apps faster is to write fast versions of hot functionality in C and expose the implementation through the C API. Um, and in fact, this is how Ruby itself made the date library and the path name library fast a few years ago. So that suggests let's do that. So a few years ago, Sam Saffron discovered that the blank question mark method was a hotspot for discourse, and he wrote a C library called FastBlank that sped up the operations by 20 times. This is a pretty huge win. It was only like 50 lines of C code. Um, that's a pretty big deal, so you might ask, why don't we do it more? Why, is it, why don't we write a lot more of Rails in C? Uh, in a nutshell, the problem with writing things in C is that it's C. Um, <laughs> C is annoying programming language to write in, but it's, more importantly, it is also unsafe to write C code, and it's risky. Uh, if you make a small mistake, your library can cause a seg fault, and nobody likes seg faults. Um, for the most part, people prefer to write, to use slow code um, at, uh, as opposed to the risk of crashing their Rails applications. Um, also, while C extensions are transparent to your users, or the, the user of the person writing the C extension, they are not transparent to the person maintaining the C extension. They significantly add burden on maintainers and contributors because C is such a painful programming language. So at Skylight, we sort of had the same kind of problem. The first version of our agent was written in pure Ruby, and it was okay. But eventually, we couldn't add some features that we really wanted to add, like uh, the important one was tracking memory allocations without blowing all the budget. You don't want to install a performance monitoring tool and suddenly have your app be super slow. Um, and that doesn't make any sense. So originally, we thought we would solve this problem by writing a C or C++ extension. But we had exactly the same problems that I discussed before. We uh, had maintenance burden for our engineers. We really, we really want everyone on the team, including junior engineers, to be able to write uh, things across our entire code base, and C is not a language like that. And also, if you make any mistakes, suddenly we're crashing our customers' apps, and our, we have you know, many thousands of customers across many environments. We can't afford for people to be reporting seg faults to us on our uh, GitHub or our customer or our um, intercom. So eventually, we decided, let's try writing a bit of an agent in Rust. And I did, it in a, I did a couple weeks of a spike and experiment, and it was so successful the first time I did it that we pulled more and more of the core functionality into Rust over time. So what is Rust? Um, just like C, Rust is a compiled and statically typed language. It emits very fast code. But unlike C, Rust has an advanced type system and carefully designed features, which are both fun, pleasant, enjoyable to use, and guarantee runtime safety. Um, what, like one of the slogans is, if it compiles, it doesn't crash. So it might sound crazy to hear about a programming language that's in the same performance league as C, but also offering you the kind of safety guarantees that you would expect from Ruby, but it's really just the same kind of guarantee that languages like Ruby offer, right? If you write a, programming, a program in Ruby, you don't have to worry, like, maybe I make a mistake in my program seg faults, and Rust uh, offers a similar guarantee. Um, the cool thing is that Rust figured out how to do it without a garbage collector using the, the ownership system, um, which you should go read about if you want to know more. Um, as a side effect, the ownership system also provides concurrency without data erasers, so concurrency is built in very nicely. Now, in high-level languages like Ruby, there's a tension between writing or using abstractions and the performance of your program. Um, when you decide to use really nice features like symbol to proc or like mapping over an, iter uh, over an array, you're paying a cost in overhead to get the sweet features. Um, most of the time, this doesn't matter. And Ruby programmers optimize for happiness in the 99% of cases where the extra overhead is worth the ergonomic improvement that you're getting. Um, and that's a really good trade-off. I think that's why everyone's here. Um, but sometimes it does matter. And in Ruby, you end up writing very low-level, unidiomatic code just to get performance in the cases where it starts to matter. Um, in Rust, you don't have to worry largely about the cost of abstractions. <laughs> That's because the compiler can see through all of your code and magically make it fast and wave. Um, for, exa <laughs> for example, if you use map.map .map instead of a handcrafted loop, the Rust compiler is smart enough to see that you're really doing a loop and optimize it into a loop. Um, and actually, very often, handcrafted, so high-level abstractions can provide faster code in Rust than the handcrafted code because you're explaining your intent very clearly to the compiler. Um, in loops, for example, if you use map, uh, the compiler eliminates bounds checks to make, because it knows, oh, I'm mapping over an array. I don't have to worry about checking all the time whether the thing I'm looking up is in the array because I'm mapping over an array. So if we go back to the original fast blank example, the one that um, uh, Sam wrote in C, when we ported it to Rust, we ended up with a one-liner. One -liner. It actually is a pretty nice one-liner. It looks pretty familiar to Ruby programmers. Um, and, but we ended up with roughly the same performance as the, as the C version, but with a single line of code. And by allowing you to use high-level abstractions instead of, uh, without cost, small amounts of code can result in very fast but also very easy-to-write programs. Now, there's an asterisk here, which is that 
when we sh when we first did this, we got the the, the unique code for fast blank is one line, but we didn't talk about the boilerplate. And last year we said, well, it sucks that you have to write all this boilerplate. So we're we announced last year a library called Helix, which allows you to write the same thing without all the boilerplate. Um, this is what we showed last year. Um, we've been writing Rust code in Ruby for a long time at Skylight. Um, but historically, there was just too much boilerplate to recommend this to regular people. Um, there might be only a single line of Rust code to write fast blank, but there's like 50 lines of boilerplate to set it up. And we made Helix to eliminate the boilerplate and let you jump directly into writing classes and methods without having to write any of the code to wire it up. Um, at a high level, like in the 90s, there was a division between scripting languages and systems languages. Uh, scripting languages handed, uh, handled orchestrating I.O. bound tasks, um, but they, and they delegated to like serious tools written by serious programmers to uh, do things like sorting, grepping, sed, sed, awk, all that stuff. Uh, those things were delegated to to do the heavy lifting. And actually, um, this kind of idea of scripting languages uh, handling I.O. bound things worked pretty well for Rails, which is largely an I.O. bound problem. Most of the time, you're just waiting for your database to give you something back, and there's not that much heavy computation going on. Um, but now, and that division historically was like, you write uh, high-level language script, scripting languages for the ergonomics, it's pleasant to write, but then the serious programmers write in really baroque, old-school programming languages. Um, but in the new era, in uh, 2017, we have system languages that started to adopt a lot of the things that are nice, that are ergonomic about scripting languages. And our goal with Helix is to allow you to write the Ruby code that you love without fearing that eventually you'll hit some CPU-bound wall that forces you to read every, rewrite everything as a fleet of Go microservices. Um, and so the idea is you can start with Ruby and you can move your CPU-bound code to Helix if it's appropriate. Now, so that was, um, that was last year, that was my talk from last year in five minutes if you want to um, watch the whole thing in not five minutes, you can do that at home, but like now we're on to the new stuff. So last year we had a really good proof of concept. Um, however, it was still too hard to use. Basically, we're also, uh, like it, in, in fact, we did generate the bowler code for you, but then there's more bowler code a boil a plate around how you set up the structure of the project and stuff like that that it's hard to figure out. Um, we're also missing some very basic features like we um, we don't support taking booleans, for example. Uh, we, don't have, uh, we don't have class methods. You can only have exactly one class in the macro, no borrowing, stuff like that. And then we don't really have exception support, so the type errors were just printed to the console. Uh, basically nothing other than them will support. Um, <laughs> So uh, this year, uh, we decided to focus on solving all those problems. So in, the, in the last year, what we worked on, we worked on, uh, we decided to focus on making it plausible for a very restricted use case and do that path really, really well. Um, so we decided to focus on uh, the use case of dropping in some Rust code into uh, into your Rails app. Maybe you have some background job or whatever that's taking a while and you would like to speed up that, uh, that code. So uh, that's the use case that we decided to focus on and uh, we, uh, obviously we worked on the missing features, basically everything worked now. And um, the reason we decided to focus on um, the real scenario is because you control the end-to-end -end -end environment so you can just, like, it is not a big deal to uh, have, to install the Rust compiler on your Deploy it like on your build servers, on your production servers, so you don't have to worry about pre-compiling it and stuff. So uh, it actually works. Like the the code we have actually works also on Rails as well, but we uh, just decided to prioritize making the Rails experience nicer. So here is the demo. Um, it is going to be an end-to-end -end example. Um, so uh, I guess I will show you what we're building. So uh, what we're building here is a very simple Rails app that has a text field that you can like type some text in there and then. And uh, click a button to flip it upside down. So uh, the trick is we will implement the core functionality of flipping the text in Rust inside the Rails app. So Rails app is going to do all the request handling, all the buttons and forms and stuff like that. But then we're going to delegate to us for um, the very heavy operation of flipping text. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, by the end of this, we're actually going to deploy this to Heroku. Uh, so let's, let's do it. All right, so uh, we are building this from scratch, so let's delete this and start over. What could possibly go wrong? Um, and so 
Uh, let's start by generating a Rails app. We're using the latest release candidate 510RC2. What could possibly go wrong? We're not going to need Active Record here, so we're just going to skip that to make deploying to Heroku a little bit easier. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's, that's the Rails app. Uh, now, let's go into the Rails app and then we'll just make sure everything is working fine. So, this is the um, Rails server, and we, as you can see, it is actually running, right? So, um, the next thing we'll do is we'll add the Helix Rails gem to the gem file. So, that's that, Helix Rails. We are currently at uh, version 050 as of like this morning. Um, so, it's fun to install. It's basically going to fetch your gems, and that's, that's it. So, it's pretty familiar so far. Um, then um, Helix Rails actually shows a generator, so we're going to use that to generate uh, what we call crates, um, which I'll explain in a moment. So that's that. And um, the Helix, the so this generated a Helix crate in a crate slash text run form. Um, so this is simultaneously a gem. You can see that there's a gem spec. And also, um, it is a Rust crate, which is basically the Rust equivalent of a gem. So there's a cargo.toml. Um, so the reason we did this is to encourage you to structure uh, your Rust code as a self-contained library, just as like this, like your um, your RSC extensions, right? Like a JSON gem is a library that do a limited amount of things. So um, this is how we recommend you to set it up for now. Um, and the next. Step is um, oh you can see that there's a lib directory for your Ruby code because it's a gem you can put whatever Ruby code in there. There's also a source directory which is the Rust convention for Rust code, right? And uh, you can see that the generator generated a text transform class verse with a single class method that prints some stuff to the console. So let's try that out. Right, we can do that by running rig RB um, in the create text transform directory. Right, so when you run Rick RB, it automatically compiled the Rust code for you and then put you into an RB with access to your Rust code. So you can type text transform dot hello, and as you can see, it is indeed printing stuff to your console. Um, it is probably worth emphasize that, em emphasizing that it might be not very obvious, but we're actually building a native extension. We're calling Rust code. This everything here is implemented in Rust, so that's pretty cool. Um, now that we have the boilerplate down, let's actually implement the text transform library. Uh, we are going to do a little bit of, let's just, just try uh, to add some tests with our, our spec that set up very quickly. Um, and one on install. Right, so now we have our spec, and we can, uh, I'll, I'll just cheat by pasting in the text I wrote earlier um, in the spec directory. Right, so we have, uh, text transform spec, and uh, it, it's pretty simple. Basically, we expect the text transform class to define a flip method that takes a string um, and it flips it. Right, so that's what we're implementing today. Um, so just to make sure we did everything correctly, we'll run the test, and as you can see, it's failing because we didn't define text transform dot flip. So that's good. We'll do that. Um, so we'll need to define a method called flip, right? So in um, librs, basically this is like a, a Rust macro, which is like a little DSL for defining Ruby classes in Rust, right? So we'll type uh, def flip, right? So that's like the usual syntax you're used to for defining method. And uh, the way Rust distinguishes between class and instance method is whether it takes a parameter called self. In this case, we're making a class method, so there's no self, and we can just take a text um, we can take a string and then we'll tell Rust that we are returning a string here. Um, it's probably worth pointing out that these are actually Rust types, right? So you, uh, all you need to do is you say, oh, this takes a Rust string and returns a Rust string and we'll figure out how to um, convert the Ruby string into Rust and then like convert your return Rust string into a Ruby string. And if the user is passing a different type, like if you're passing a number, for example, it would automatically raise a Ruby uh, type error for you. So basically all the things that you're used to. Um, and so I'm gonna paste in the implementation here. It looks a little bit long, but uh, 
it's basically just a large table, right? What you're really doing is you're taking a text, right? Like the, sorry, the a string called, which we call text, right? Like you're looping through each characters, you're calling dot ref, which reverses the characters, and then you're mapping each character in the table, and then at the end, you join them back into a string. So pretty familiar syntax, uh, pretty high level. Uh, you might think that using all of these high level features would make things very slow, but um, again, the compiler is basically magic, so if you do uh, the chars.ref.map, it doesn't actually make an array and then reverse the array and then map it. It just like figure out this is what you're gonna do, so we're just gonna do the smart thing. Um, for you out of the box, and it's probably gonna be faster than whatever smart things that you might try to do yourself. And like it knows how to allocate the right amount of size right. string for the output and how to look one byte at a time and all that stuff. So uh, what we did is we ran our spec again, unfortunately, the test is still failing. It's still saying we didn't implement text transform.flip, which we clearly did. Um, the problem is Rust is a compiled language, so we actually need to recompile code after making changes. Um, that being said, the Rust compiler is fairly fast, so you're not gonna um, spend a lot of time waiting for things to compile. Uh, so to fix this problem, we can run rig build, uh, and if we run our spec again afterwards, then it is gonna work. Um, obviously, it's a little bit annoying to have to remember to run rig build all the time, so we're just gonna make a rig task for it, which you're probably gonna do anyway. Um, so, right, so this is basically a standard R spec setup. You have an R spec task. The key here is to make uh, rig build a dependency of rig uh, spec. So, uh, just to show that it works, um, I'm gonna go add a new test for it. It can flip table. Um, and basically, if you give it a table, it will flip the table. If you give the flip table, it will flip it back. <laughs> right. So now, uh, if we go run the test again, it is not working as expected. Right. So now we can implement this again. Uh, we'll go back to lib the RS, and then we'll paste in two special cases at the top. And now we'll go back to the console and run rig spec. Uh, remember, we didn't actually run rig build, right? But then it automatically noticed that you changed some files, so recompile it and then run the spec for you. And now it's passing. So that's that. So now we have a fully working, fully tested text transform library. Let's actually use it in Rails. Um, as you can see, the generator already edited it to our app's gem file, so we don't have to do anything special here. And um, so we'll start by adding a route, a, a resource called flips, and we'll. Um, so we'll go to Rouse RB, and then we'll do a resource of uh, flips, and then we'll map it to the root path, and uh, we only need the index and the create action in this case, so we'll do that. Um, the next step is to add a controller, right? So uh, we'll go to app controllers, and then we'll make a flips controller dot RB, right? And then we'll uh, paste some code, but basically in the index action, we default the string to either URL param or we default it to hello world, right? Like, and then in the create action, we call the text transform dot flip method that we implemented in Rust. Um, so finally, uh, we will make a template for this. And uh, so you go to views and then make a folder called flips and we'll make an index.html.erb for it. Uh, it's just gonna be a very, very simple uh, form that has a single text field and a button. And uh, the Rails defaults for all of these helpers worked out to like be um, exactly what we wanted, so that's very nice. Um, so now with everything in place, we can test it out in the browser. Um, so we're going back to the app and run Rails S. And so now if we refresh, we have a flipper and you can see that it can flip X, you can flip so my God, and you can also flip tables. <laughs> um, so that is it. So as you can see, with pretty minimal effort, we were able to create a Ruby native extension uh, written in Rust using Helix, not have to worry about secfaults, and it's like the code is still pretty high level, pretty easy to work with, uh, and we even have a test for it. Um, so finally, let's deploy our app to Heroku as promised. As it turns out, I actually have something to sell you. Uh, so 
uh, you need a Heroku account in the Heroku CLI, but I already have those set up on my computer, so we, uh, we are just going to create a Heroku app, and we'll call it Helix Flipper, right? So uh, we will, because this is a Rust and Ruby app, we have to set up the build packs manually, so first we'll add the Rust build pack. Many thanks to Terrence from Heroku for making this work. And uh, we'll then add the usual Ruby build pack for the Rails part of things. And that's it, right? So now, as it is recommending, we should run git push Heroku master to do it. So, um, so git push Heroku master. Um, so now you can see the Rust build pack is downloading the Rust compiler for you automatically. And, uh, and we're now into the Ruby part, so this is just running bundle install, downloading all the Ruby dependencies. Um, and then now we're on to, we're compiling the Rust code. Um, so this is downloading the Rust dependencies, and um, yeah, looks like that's it. Um, it's launching the Dino, but now that's done, we can go to the browser to see it in helix flippercom you can try it on your phone if you want to. Um, so as you can see, it works, and um, now we have a uh, Rails app running Rust code in production on the Flipper internet. Um, yeah, so back to you. So I want to talk about like why, you, how you might want to use Helix. First of all, you should take a, a breath to realize that that was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> So I want to talk about like what use cases uh, Helix is good for. So first of all, in general, Helix is good for problems that use heavy computation and simple inputs. Um, the boundary cost of crossing into Helix is still a little higher than we would like, but for problems that do a non-trivial amount of work in Rust, the cost of the boundary crossing, crossing pays off pretty quickly. Um, also, things like data tables, file names, JSON objects are all like simple inputs, so you can get pretty far with the types that we already support in Helix. Um, think about it this way, the Helix boundary is uh, cheaper and supports more types than a background job. So if you could have moved the work into a background job, you can make it work in Helix. Um, as an example, <clears throat> um, we built a demo that counts the number of words in a text file. Um, we, when we measure all the words in all the works of Shakespeare, Ruby takes about three seconds to do it. Rust does it in 30 milliseconds. Um, and this example takes advantage of Rayon, which uh, is a, Ruby li a Rust library that lets you parallelize loops. So here's, an, here's the example. It's basically using what uh, Godfrey showed you before. Uh, look, at the inputs are both strings. The return type is a 32-bit integer. Um, the string, one of the strings is a file name. And just a um, note that dot .expect is a Rust uh, method that, call, that uh, throw, raises a panic, and that can get converted into an exception in Ruby. Um, so what you can see here is we, ha we, get, we open a file from the file name, then we convert it into an iterator, and then map over it and count how many lines there are. Um, uh, you can, um, if you use the Rayon library in Rust, which is just a library that you can get off the shelf, if you change into iter into, into par iter, uh, now it's parallelized. It works across however many cores you have on your computer. So that's one of the ways that we get to 30 milliseconds is that we were able to use four cores or however many we use in that, um, in that benchmark. Another really good reason to use Helix in general is if you want to use existing Rust libraries from your Ruby application. One of the main reasons why this ends up being good and important is because Servo is a web browser written in Rust. Uh, Firefox actually shares a lot of code with Servo. Um, so there's a lot of production quality libraries that already deal with the concept of web content. Turns out we're working on a web framework, so um, things that deal with web content are very helpful. Um, so as an example, I built a demo that inlines CSS into HTML, like if you were building an email thing and you want to inline, you have a CSS file, you have an HTML file, you want to inline it together. Um, and we were able to use Servo CSS parser and Servo HTML parser and only needed a bit of code to glue it all together, um, which is actually pretty cool. Basically, like here's the, Here's an example. Um, so basically, you're, you, we're using the, the CSS parser from Servo, then we're looping over all the rules that we got from the CSS parser, uh, and then we're looping, looping over all the elements and inlining things with a style to attribute if we want to. Um, and so it's kind of like writing C bindings, like if you're like, oh, I know there's a libxml library and I want to use it, but now I can write a C binding. It's kind of like that, except it's way easier to do it. Um, you can also use Helix in a request, in a mailer, in a background job, in action cable or in any part of Rails, and since mailers and background jobs tend to be more CPU intensive, don't discount those use cases. I think those use cases are a really good fit for Helix. 
Um, it also means in general, you might have moved some CPU intensive thing out of the request into a background job because it was just too expensive. You might be able to move some of those back if, it may, if it's good for you to put into the request flow. Um, so, okay. Uh, I, I realize we, in the examples we show, we that didn't actually show you all the features that we worked on in the last year. Uh, we have a website that actually shows you all the things that we do. Yeah, all, you know, both of the demos that I talked about are on the yeah. Helix website and like you can play with them in a Rails app. Yeah. So some of the features that we worked on is you can have multiple classes now, you can have public, private classes, you can have instance methods, which somehow none of the examples use. You can also have, uh, uh, a struct in Helix for storing instance states, so it's like instance variables, except you tell the compiler exactly what you will have, so it can optimize the access a lot better. But uh, if, if you're familiar with the Ruby C API, that's basically the data wrap struct API that we wrapped in, uh, in the Rust macro, which is really cool. Unfortunately, we don't have time or examples to show you. Um, anyway, I, I guess we'll close this off by telling you what doesn't work. So a lot of things works already. As you mentioned, there's a lot of use cases that you can start um, playing around with it if you happen to have to write um, problems in your Rails app. Um, however, as Helix is still a pretty young project with a lot of work still to be done. Uh, still to be done. So this basically, we, we're, we're trying to give you a better sense of where we're at and like maybe there are some opportunities for you to uh, contribute back to if uh, you happen to have one of those use cases that we don't support yet. Um, so we broke down the outstanding work in different use cases. The first um, use case is a Greenfield project, which I consider done. So basically you're developing a brand new feature or brand new app or rewriting a feature inside your app as opposed to rewriting something or as opposed to implementing something in a library, right? The, the difference is since it is in your app, you have full control over the API so you can make uh, adjustments in the um, in your API to work around the current limitations in Helix, right? So um, you might use Helix for like a CPU bound algorithm here uh, in a request, mail a background job as you pointed out. Um, and basically the problems with a potential for parallelism is also a good fit as you uh, mentioned. So uh, we currently only support, like for the types, I think we only support uh, strings, numbers, booleans, and the basic types like that. Um, that sounds a little bit limiting, but then if you think about it, because uh, HTTP requests and background jobs actually shares the same constraint, right? like you cannot put a Ruby object through an HTTP request, you can marshal it and then send the bytes across. You can, like it, you can, you can, you can do that in Helix too, right? So um, because you already are used to working with the the string constraint in the request, you can actually do a fair amount even with just strings, numbers, and booleans. Uh, so, yeah, so that's the Greenfield project use case. Um, the next use case, which we're currently working on, uh, which builds on top of the Greenfield project feature list, is uh, you're writing some code in a, uh, you're rewriting some code in a public library uh, from Ruby to Rust. So basically it's like how you have JSON colon colon pure and then you need to have a API compatible version uh, in a native extension that is like, a, it needs to be a high fidelity match, right? Because you use, you cannot change the API. So that's a little bit tricky because there tends, so the, the benchmark we're using for this, I don't, I don't mean in a performance sense, but the the, example that we're using here to help ourselves understand how far along we are is access support duration, right? So um, it is a fairly simple class, but because uh, there are a lot of dynamic features in Ruby, you end up having, like there's one, there will be one method that happens to take an optional argument and we happen to not support optional arguments uh, yet. So there are, there are a lot of edge cases like that that we're still uh, working on, so this is maybe not quite there yet, but it's uh, it's probably the next thing to check off the list. Um, if this is what you're trying to do today, though, you can still accomplish a lot by mixing and matching, uh, mixing and matching Ruby and Rust. You don't actually have to do literally everything in Rust, right? As uh, as I show you, there's a lib directory in the crates that you can put Ruby code in there. So what you can do is perhaps um, define do like basically define a class in Rust, do the heavy lifting in there, and then you can define some sugar on top in the Ruby, like you can reopen the class in Ruby, right, and then you can take optional arguments or whatever, and then you can normalize that and call back into Rust. And that is not ideal, but it works. Um, and the long-term goal is indeed to make all of those work in, 
in Helix, we're just not quite there on the, in the in the DSL yet. So some things that you will probably notice are missing are uh, we don't support module yet. We don't support optional arguments, rest arguments, keyword arguments. Um, like uh, sometimes you want to take like a generic numeric. Like you don't want to care whether it's a float, an integer, or a big num, or complex, rational, right? Like so. Uh, there's something, yeah, so that's numeric, and sometimes we overload in, um, in Ruby, right? Like the same parameter could be one of many types. Uh, we have plans to make all those work. It's just still coming along, but as, as I mentioned, you can, always, um, you can always normalize those difference in Ruby and call, uh, call back in the rest. Um, so that's that, and then uh, reopen is a little bit strange but a lot of Echo support stuff reopen core classes, so we're, it kind of works now, but it's not amazing yet, and we have some work to do there. And um, this also is very easy to do a wrapping strategy, like yep. a mix and match strategy. Right, so you can do the reopen in Ruby. The, the key is you want to, like, the parts that make sense to move in Rust is the algorithm, heavy lifting parts, right? So, like, you can still do a lot of that in Rust, and you can use those code in Ruby, like we did in the Rails example. Um, I guess I'll just go through the rest very quickly because we're running out of time. Um, so shipping to production, as you can see, we actually kind of made that work with help from Terence, right? Like it actually works on Heroku and stuff. Um, the the things I'm missing is we like it works as long as you have a Rust compiler on the on the server, but we don't have documentation for how to do it. So if you're interested in figuring out, you might want to contribute some documentation there. Um, and um, Let's see, binary distribution is interesting. So if you, if you are a library author and you want to use Helix, um, you probably want to make sure that people can install your gem without having a Rust compiler on their computer. So this is what we mean by binary distribution. There are some other gems in the Ruby ecosystem, like uh, the, the thing that wraps libv8 does it. Basically, you have and to- like, And Skylight, we do right. it ourselves. And, and Skylight. Basically, we have to make this work in a way that is so automated we, we because already, we need it ourselves. We already have ways to make it work, but we need <laughs> to extract that into open source version, right? So uh, we basically, you basically pre-compile the, the binary for all the major platforms. There are like a handful of them. Um, and then you, like, people can just download the, like when you gem install, you can just download that binary and it works. So uh, that, we still need to work on the tooling to make it possible. We know it is possible because, as you just said, we actually do it in Skylight. Um, and then there is the, some non-traditional use cases like mobile, WebAssembly, and Ruby. Um, and uh, performance parity with C, as you mentioned, we are like a little bit um, slower than C right now, so we need to have some good benchmarks to figure out where the overheads are. And uh, the long-term goal is uh, we want to be on par with uh, the equivalent C native extension that you would write. But like when we say a little bit slower than C, we're like Ruby is like here, C is here, Rust is like here. So like if you're moving code from Ruby into Rust, it doesn't like it. And it's almost entirely the boundary cost that's more expensive. Like Rust itself is very competitive with C. So if you have a, if you're treating it like a background job, then it's not a, you don't have to worry about it at all. It's if you have a chatty API, you should, then you want us to fix this problem. Right, so um, then uh, finally, there's some miscellaneous features and quality of life improvements that we want to make. Like we want to support more types. It's actually, we have the protocol down, so it's actually quite easy to add more types. Uh, we just haven't gotten around. And you just have to decide like, what does it mean to convert a hash in Ruby to a hash map in Rust? Like what is that? Um, and also we're, re we're quite reliant on the Rust macro system for the DSL, so when you have syntax error in the in the macro, the errors are quite brutal. Um, we are working on that, and like, if, if that's the kind of things that you're interested in, we should talk more, and uh, maybe you can help there, too. Um, so, so that's basically it. I guess I kind of ran out of time, so here is the website for everything else that I didn't have time to cover. Um, UseHelix.com, you can go look at it, and um, we are, I think we're in, we, we have this setup in the Skylight booth, so if you want to um, come play with it uh, or chat with us, we are there today and, and tomorrow. The website, usehelix.com, is a Rails app. All the demos are written in Helix. 
in the Rails app. So if you go look at the repo for uselix.com, the source code for all the demos that we showed today are in there, and they're the same code that's running on the website. Right, and a lot of you are probably looking for opportunities to contribute, so we uh, deliberately sprinkle up typos in the website. So <laughs> you can find that the, the roadmap webpage is a, a more a detailed description of what Godfrey talked about, and we're going to be adding GitHub issues for everything soon. We're out of time, but this is the best slide. Um, thank you very much.